Thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak here. I have to start by saying I'm actually not a Western Australian. I actually live in Tasmania and I'm still one of the dying breeds of fly in, fly out. So, but I've been doing that for the last uh, 20 years, so I think I qualify for my uh, frequent flyer badge. What I'm going to talk to you about is uh, using integrated asset modelling to improve oil and gas planning decisions and we definitely are in a volatile market, I think we all know that. So just before I start, I just want to, just some relevant experience, uh, Matt did introduce, I've got 40 years plus in the, in the industry and I've actually got 30 years uh, in integrated planning models. So my very first introduction to planning was with Shell back in the early 1980s when I was running an integrated network modelling gas simulation in the North Sea and uh, that was a program called GASO which I don't think exists anymore. Then the early 1990s back in Australia I installed with SO Australia uh, for the Gippsland Basin Fields gas planning software which is still in use today and also with ExxonMobil Malaysia for the Peninsula gas fields and it's also been run since then on the North Coast Shelf. So between the 1980s and 2015, uh, I've been involved with many integrated planning models in, in South America, North Africa, Southeast Asia, Middle East, Europe, Scandinavia, etc. I think the only place I haven't worked actually is in Russia. So apart from that, so I'm going to move on pretty quickly through this and then hopefully we can have a robust discussion session question and answers after the, the model. Before I get going, I'm going to do something completely different. And I've got a short video track, which I'm going to play. And I think that's going to set the frame for uh, what we're going to talk about. So I'm going to turn that on, and I hope the sound and everything works, and we'll see how it goes. So. Paul and Brigitte Vitalios could be entering Germany's newest art gallery. Or maybe it's a concert hall, or a really upscale hotel. Well, think again. They're here to buy a car. They've come to one of the most innovative manufacturing facilities in the world. It's in the heart of downtown Dresden, a city best known for its historic buildings. But that's changing thanks to Volkswagen's new transparent factory. As the name Transparent Factory says, it's transparent. You can see everything here in the Transparent Factory. Part assembly plant, part museum, it's the only factory in the world where you can peer through glass walls and see cars being made right before your eyes. But selling the people of Dresden on the idea of a downtown factory required some creative thinking. So they expected like big traffic, pollution and noise. And what we now have is a very quiet place and with almost no traffic because all of our parts we're getting with a cargo tram. The VW cargo trams share streetcar tracks with the city's public transit vehicles. They deliver auto parts directly to the factory. Inside, the parts are sorted into containers. A robotic sled then drives each container through the assembly hall, up and down elevators, finally parking beside one specific car body. The robots find their way with the help of a special magnetic guidance system. So this driverless transportation system is orientating by over 60,000 magnets embedded in the floor like a road map. With the correct parts at hand, the assembly team set to work. And while they work, they're gently put into motion. The entire production line sits on a wide conveyor belt built into the floor. It moves ever so slowly in a big loop around the factory. The floor also delivers power for tools and computer systems. This portable workstation is getting the energy by induction from the floor and it runs this computer system. So this computer tracks every screw for safety relevant systems like the airbag system. After one complete lap on the floor conveyor, the cars begin a second tour of the factory, this time suspended from on high. The chassis seem to float overhead as if performing some sort of bizarre automotive ballet. At the end of the line, the newly minted Phaetons go through a series of quality control checks. After a final buff and polish, it's off to the storage silo, yet another unique feature of the transparent factory. Each new car will wait here for its new owner. 
Unless, of course, the new owner is already waiting for his or her new phaeton. In that case, there's only one thing left to do. Cool. Thanks for listening to that, and you're probably wondering what on earth car manufacturing in Germany has got to do with the oil and gas industry in Australia. And that's really is, is the whole essence of, of why I'm going to talk to you today. So this is Volkswagen's transparent factory in space in Dresden. And this is not a, an automatic robotic factory. It's actually built, hand-built, top-range Volkswagens. It also builds Bentleys. And it's a factory where the cars are hand-built, but obviously computer-assisted. And that's really the message that I want to talk about today in our industry when we're doing integrated asset um, modelling. That we need, in some sense, particularly in a volatile market, to, to really focus on some of these issues that Volkswagen, and particularly the German automotive industry, does so well. So let's have a look at what the VW Transferent Factory is all about. It's got essentially an assembly line. And the assembly line starts off with the inventory, which is all the components. It does engine assembly, it does axle assembly, it does the press shop, weld shop, final assembly, and out to the customer. So this is very much, let's see where this works. This is our assembly line. These are, all, these are the inventory that goes in, these are the, the assembly sections, body mounting, final assembly, out to the customer. In physical terms, we have the inventory coming in, in this case by a tram. We have the car coming out as what, we're, what Volkswagen is selling. And in the middle, we have people doing the assembly. And the issue here, this is not an automatic factory. If you want to see a robotic factory, go and have a look at Honda or one of those. You'll see nothing but robots. These are actually involved real people, very skilled people, doing very skilled assembly for top of the line, top quality vehicles. And what I'm going to talk about is how do we translate this assembly line approach into integrated asset modelling. So just moving on, I'm going to move now from a Volkswagen factory and I'm going to move to what we do in our industry and have a look at it from assembly point of view. This is what I'm going to call the oil and gas factory. The oil and gas factory has reservoir, wells, pipelines, compression facilities and customer and they can be in different orders. The facilities could be offshore as a separator, they could be on onshore gas plant. Your customer could be DOM gas, it could be LNG, it could be industrial gas, it could be power gen. But this basically is the line of, of workflow. If I look down below, we have the physical components. So I have a physical reservoir, physical wellheads, pipelines, compression, uh, uh, perhaps a gas plant off to my customer. And this is essentially the workflow that we do in integrated asset management. And the focus I'm going to do is say, how do we look at that from the assembly line point of view? How do we get as efficient in our industry as Germany is in its automotive manufacture? And that's really the position that we're going to talk about. So I flick again and we move away from the physical oil and gas factory to the digital oil and gas factory. Because that's essentially what we're all doing when we're doing modelling. We're actually running a digital version of the physical assets. So the issue here is, what have I got? I've got down below reservoir structure, geology, petrophysics, and we all model those. We have wells, completions, tubing, and this is essentially my subsurface modelling. I go up the, up the surface to my surface pipeline separation, compression, my processing, my crude plant, my LNG plant, and this is my facilities production modelling. And then I move on to the other major component, integrated uh, modelling, is looking at my marketing. I have my markets, could be gas markets, condensate, gas storage, component markets. I have DOM gas, I have export gas. I might be running an FPSO as part of my gas system, taking the condensate off. And I'm also running, right down the line here, I'm doing, looking at LNG, tank storage, cargo scheduling, load, loading, loading. And I might go all the way actually out to LNG portfolio management. What's the best way to sell my LNG cargoes into a market, which particularly at the moment, when I perhaps have, or looking to the future, surplus LNG supply and a very volatile market. So, and these are all are integrated. The reservoir is integrated 
ultimately with what I sell in the portfolio. But there's one issue here. We're not like the uh, car factory. The factory is a very system process oriented system. Everything works according to a specific time frame. What do we got? We have a real problem is that we have a planning horizon which can vary from years because subsurface uncertainty in reservoir may take years to manifest. But we might go down to days, um, particularly when I'm looking at cargo scheduling. I might go down to days when I'm looking at planned or, or, or unplanned um, downtime. So we have to cope in our integrated modelling with time frames which vary from years down to days and possibly even down to hours. So the challenge for us is how do we approach this system which is integrated from reservoir all the way through our pipelines all the way out to LNG, for example, and actually cope with the different time frames. And the purpose of the talk here is to say that we cannot necessarily run that with one size model which does everything. It would be like trying to say, OK, we're going to have one car for the whole company. So the managing director is going to drive a van and you're going to drive a van and the delivery people are going to drive a van. We're just going to have one vehicle. That's obviously not going to work. And the same approach won't work in integrated asset modelling. So moving forward, how do I cope with that? So before we start, we need to understand what are the value drivers for integrated asset modelling. We all pay lip service to it, but what, what does it actually mean? Well, if I'm actually doing integrated asset modelling, not just designing the system, because that's obviously going to generate um, billions of dollars of revenue, but to optimise on the short term, we actually see that we can actually have a big prize. If we actually get our integrated modelling correct, we can actually generate hundreds of millions of dollars of increased value. And that's what our job is. Our job is pretty straightforward, is to increase the value of the supply chain to the corporate drivers. So we can do additional spot cargoes, increasingly of concern moving into the future world. Australia has just recently, with its export of cargoes out of um, Queensland, has now displaced Malaysia as the second largest LNG exporter. It's when our other projects come on, we're probably going to displace Gatar as the largest LNG exporter. But there's going to be a lot of competition out there. And the market's changing. For example, uh, Argentina was historically a large importer of LNG. They estimate over the next few years, their imports of LNG are going to drop by 29%. So there's a, a lot of competition in the marketplace to sell more LNG, if I'm talking about that. <laughs> We may want to increase our production of condensates or other liquids and still meet our market demand. So th there's an optimization there of how do I do my component sales, whether it's ethane, propane and butane, or my liquids condensate and still meet my LNG export contracts and my DOM gas contracts. There's a whole host of optimization drivers that come into this process. Clearly, we always do uncertainty quantification. What if? What happens if this goes down? What happens if we move compression forward? What happens if we do a field expansion? They're all bread and butter of integrated asset modelling, etc. Right down to reliability, reliability of supply and emergency uh, hazard management. I mean, we do know that gas plants supply goes down. In Western Australia, we had a, a big problem not so many years ago. So you need to see is, if we really need to turn the, the, the taps on, how much we can deliver perhaps into the domestic gas market. But this $100 million, they're all actually quantified in papers. These are actually two, two shell papers. And quite a few of those people actually come out of Perth. So that's the corporate value driver. And we're all great. We all love our corporates. But the issue is, what is the value of integrated asset modelling to you? At the end of the day, we are people. We have jobs, we work, we know what we do, and unless we actually have see what it can mean to us, whether good or bad, then we may not fully buy into the project. And I'm not going to be a scaremonger, but I want to point out some interesting correlations with the oil industry and the motor vehicle industry. So let's just look at the Brent oil price. 
dollars per barrel. We see here clearly, from this is from 2002, it goes roaring upwards, peaks about $130 a barrel. Oh, lovely days. Drops dramatically in the GFC, starts climbing again, and now we've got the current oil price shock. And the price now is, I think for Brent, is about, is it, I come about $48 a barrel or something. So this is what we see in the oil price. If we're planning forward, we need to understand that this is the sort of thing that happens, and it's not, not nice. I mean, I've, I've lived through quite a few oil price shocks, uh, going right back a long time. Now, let's go and look at the motor vehicle industry. This is the Australian motor vehicle exports. And why did I take 2002? It's a very good reason. 2002 was in when that Volkswagen factory started operation. It's already been in operation 13 years. Now you say, well, what's relevance of that? Well, the Australian motor vehicle industry was continued to grow up. It's grown quite rapidly. Bang, GFC drops right down, right down. It didn't grow quite as rapidly as the oil price back again, but it still was quite substantial growth. But what do we know about the Australian motor vehicle industry? Well, it's very sad, isn't it? Because in 2017, it's going to shut down. Ford are leaving, uh, General Motors are leaving, Toyota are leaving, Mitsubishi's already left. I'm old enough to remember when British Leyden produced the P7 out of Sydney. In 2017, the, oil the car industry is shutting down. Why? Well. People, these are a variety of reasons, you can pick your reason. Say, too many local manufacturers, well we're going from three to zero. High local costs, we're not competitive because we're too far from the market or our salaries are too high. Or failure to implement best technologies. Very recently I spoke to Ian McFarlane who's the Minister for Industry and Science at a seminar back home in Tasmania. And he said, when he went to visit uh, um, General Motors in South Australia, he said, are you going to be in the long term? And this is before they cut the funding. He said, they said, of course we are. Yeah, we're in Australia for the long term. He said, show me your new model design. Show me your clay model of the new car you're producing. Because you have to produce all these at least five years in advance of going to production. They had nothing. They weren't investing in new technology in Australia. But what's the relevance of this? Well, look at our oil and gas industry. We could be in a potential LNG oversupply situation. It'd be a brave man to say we're not. There's LNG projects being delayed or cut back. Uh, high local costs is a very interesting one, isn't it? Because Recently, they published the salaries of people in the oil and gas industry. Australia has the highest average salaries in the world in the oil and gas industry. And you can say to yourself, goody, because I'm a benefit of that. But it has comes at a cost. And are we going to get competition from new technologies? Well, we already have moving LNG from onshore to offshore. FLNG is a new technology how much of design and fabrication of FLNG is going to be done in Australia? Very little. But interesting enough, you say, well, Australia, its manufacture, uh, automotive industry is closing down. But look at Volkswagen, still running that factory. But Europe must be the most competitive environment for selling cars. So how come Europe doesn't suffer from too many local manufacturers? You've got Volkswagen, Renault, you, you, you name them all. High local costs. Germans are some of the highest paid workers in the world, just like us. What does that factory tell us though? Back in 2002, Volkswagen implemented what looks to our eyes as a brand new top of the line automotive assembly plant. We have nothing in Australia which competes with it. So I'm saying the reason why we're closing our motor vehicle assembly plant in Australia, all our car manufacturers closing, is very much because 
we have not implemented best technology. We're lagging behind that. And my message to you guys is that we have to do the same in the oil and gas industry. Who else is saying about this? Let's have a look. Deloitte's was at the South Australia conference in August last year. And they put up this very interesting slide. They looked at 60 projects in Queensland. And we know projects in Queensland are mainly coal seam gas. And everybody thought coal seam gas, they spoke to, said, oh, we're in the gas industry, that's a high margin industry, we don't have to worry. Well, coal seam gas, as we probably should know, is the highest cost gas you can produce in the world. It's the first gas that gets shut in in America when the price drops. And once they looked at this and they said, let's look at the processes and systems. And they said, look at the technical team. They were poor communications. Look at the, the processes we do. They're all bespoke, they're all hand built. So they, they lack scalability. They live, people live in silos. Have you heard the word silo? That we don't talk to our neighbours. We keep our data to ourselves. We don't know what's happening down the corridor. So there was hands-off approach to talking to other groups. And the one that particularly I'm interested in here was silo disciplines. That they had technical incompatibility between the different groups of the company. And all of this drives to increased operating costs. So they had cost overruns, low innovation, very costly maintenance of the systems. And of course you say, well, yeah, of course coal seam gas is expensive, we need to drill lots of wells and keep drilling wells and get exposed to the water, and we've got environment, environmental issues and we have to keep the greenies quiet. I mean, we don't have those problems in, in, in our West Australian gas industry, but we do, we know that. And the issue is, um, where are we now in our industry? With the change in the oil price, dropping to less than half of what it was, suddenly the gas industry in particular, because the gas prices tend to be linked to oil, but these industries were high margin and now the margins are a lot lower. So while we could sit here and quite say, oh well that's Queensland, hey, we're Western Australia, we're quite different, the world has changed. We're in a low margin business at the moment. We all hope the price will pick up and it surely will at some point but at the moment it's low margin. And so we have to take Deloitte seriously and say, how do we fix it? Well, Deloitte's have a view. They said Australia could innovate its oil and gas business model along the lines of a factory. And it's interesting, I found the slide after I'd done the Volkswagen Transparent Factory video. And I agree with them. We need to have faster communications we need factory processes. Everything we do has to be scalable. Not just in the field and the physical hardware, but how we do the planning. We need transparency, we need integrated planning, and that's of course here. Integrated planning has to be responsive, has to be able to change and adapt to changing conditions. And if you do that, you'll end up with decreased operating costs. And that's the real message that's coming through is that if we continue business as normal, assuming we live in a high margin industry, it doesn't matter how much we spend, we can go the way of the mocha vehicle industry. Yeah, will it be oil and gas in Australia? It's all going to be done offshore. We know the fabrication's done in Korea and Singapore. Now, how many people in this office now want to outsource their jobs to Singaporeans or Koreans or whatever, who can do planning just as well as we can? So that, that's the message. So, I'm going to talk a bit more detail. I'm going to mine down into the, into the detail of how I see it. And this is my personal view. Can a spreadsheet be part of integrated asset modelling? My view is very clearly, no. So many times I've been asked into a company and say, we've got this big spreadsheet. We don't know where it comes from. It takes 40 minutes to run, but hey, that's our main planning tool. And they said, can you duplicate it with one of my software? And we do it, and we always find a mistake. This is a study where they, they, they audited uh, something like 130 different spreadsheets and found 88% had errors in them. So what sort of errors? You're saying, oh, they're just a little trivial error perhaps. But no, I'm not going to go through the whole lot of errors. But look, they said one error would have cost a billion dollars. 
down here, six had errors exceeding $10 million in value, and one had an error exceeding $100 million. Now this is real numbers. There's a European interest group that looks at spreadsheets and they have lists and lists of horror stories. And I know we all use spreadsheets. We often do spreadsheets for economic analysis and link different programs together and hey, we're, we're so clever we never make a mistake. But what I'm saying is these are the sort of mistakes that can wipe out a business unit. So why I say no, don't use spreadsheets. I know you all do, but you, know, you can't change overnight, but be very careful with spreadsheets. Now I'm going to go to the other side and I'll probably be offensive to some of you. Ah, that was my thing I forgot. Don't use spreadsheets. Moving on. I'm going to put up a workflow. I bet you've all seen this workflow. There's papers published every year on a workflow like this. So what do we do? We do 3D reservoir simulation. We do detailed world war modelling. We have a very detailed network model. We maybe have a detailed compression model wondering about restaging, rewheeling, whatever, recycle. We probably have a very detailed, maybe a thermodynamic process model all linked to some. And this actually comes from a marketing paper where they're trying to optimise LNG cargoes. This is probably about as detailed as you can get in a workflow. Now, before I start, I'm going to knock simulation in a minute, but I write simulators, so I think I'm entitled to talk about them. But is that an integrated asset modelling workflow? Well, the answer is, in my view, no. This is a flow assurance model. Flow assurance to me is distinctly different from integrated asset modelling. It's part of it, it's a critical part of it, particularly when it comes to contract obligations, but it's not the full story, it's only part of the story. And that's why we have to get back and look at the factory. So, integrated asset modelling, it has to be able to do what I call a cycle of inference. We have to move around a circle of reservoirs, pipelines, wells, compression, market, and it has to be done on a very timely, fast basis. And this is what I say. I say if you do the productivity gain, if you're doing a big integrated model that's taking eight hours to run, you can probably only do one analysis in a day, or maybe a couple. If you can do that same run in eight minutes, your productivity gain is a factor of ten. And in a low margin business, which we are today, productivity gain is where we have to be going. So that's the story. And it was inadvertent, I noticed right at the end that we're actually four minutes to midnight. So what I'm saying is integrated asset, asset modelling has to be able to do a timely effective loop around the circle. Everything is integrated. Now, just a little bit of refinement here on reservoir modelling. And I'm going to say, why are large 3D finite difference models that we use every day often worse for planning purposes than a simple decline curve? And there's a very good reason for this. This is data from the North Sea, this interesting little plot. It's got a thing here called Geoscore, which is a measure of geological complexity. Okay? And you can calculate that from faults and etc. compartments. Up on the left hand side is the change in reservoir reserves four years after project sanction. So you sanction the project, what are the reserves like four years after? Ivanhoe, this is a North Sea field, great. Four years after project sanction, the reserves have gone up by 70%. But very low reservoir complexity. We underestimated the reserves. But look at Tartan down here. Its reserves dropped by 70% it's a complex reservoir. What I'm saying is at the beginning of the project life, your simulation model was in these two reservoirs was wrong. This is again from the North Sea. It's a SPE paper showing how the reserves changed in a gas field from project startup. Here, there's the exploration phase. The project was came up here. And look at the reserves change over. They, almost, they doubled the reserves. So the issue is, if we're doing gas planning, for example, and we're running our simulation model here based on our best model at this time, then we're going to be hopelessly wrong. So 
Long-term field outcomes are usually significantly different from what I call the early best case models. Now I can see one or two geologists in the room and they're probably saying, hey, our models are always great. Huh. How often do we drill a well and it doesn't come in? We blame the geology, particularly for reservoir simulation engineers. Nothing to do with us. The whole point of planning is, if we're planning 40 years into the future, 40 years into the future, what's the point of planning 40 years into the future of a model which we know is wrong? The question we have to ask ourselves is not that it's wrong, is how wrong is it? And how do we capture that uncertainty? So, this is what I call chaining the workflow with too much detail. And a couple of papers on simulation, and essentially they're saying, if you have too much detail, you have excessive development times, an unnecessary complication without increasing the reliability of forecasts. In our oil industry, our forecasts early on are notoriously unreliable. It takes time to drill wells, to actually calibrate our seismic data to actually perhaps prothy in it to gross. And the model actually may become so complicated, actually limits our understanding. So, my view is that we actually chain manacle ourselves if we have too much detail. I'm not going to say we don't do it, it has a role to come in, but the message is this is not an integrated asset model, it may be overcomplicating the system. Okay, so where am I? Let's go back to my oil and gas factory and say how do we do this? Well, the factories is here, we go from our, our reservoir, here's our reservoir, wells. Here's our actually physical reservoir, here's our client. And the point I want to make here is that I'm not advocating a robotic automatic solution. We can't do that. Every reservoir field development's different. We need uh, smart people doing this. Of course, I do have geologists on the display, so maybe that's an oxymoron. But. So, Let's, let, let's see, how do I do this assembly line approach? Let's look at the components. This is, this is my view, this is my personal tour through the system. I'll get the right button. We have simulation. It's precise, but usually wrong without a good history match. In fact, we can often say it's precisely wrong. Okay. We use a material balance tank. They're good on reserves range, it's very easy to say, here's my low case um, gas in place, here's my high case, we can always run that with a material balance tank. But they're poor, obviously we don't model any displacement processes in a material balance tank, if that's the, the criteria. And we need calibration to test data to get our measured permeable KH, our inflow performance. And type fields, they're not particularly good. And the type curve, which is commonly used in, in planning, where you actually run your simulation model, and from that you generate a well capacity curves based on perhaps um, cumulative production or pressure or time. They're actually quite neat. I quite like time curves because you can scale them. If I have a type curve of production versus cumulative, cumulative oil in place, I can actually scale the cumulative oil in place axis and say, what happens if I produce 20% more in my reservoir, if I've got 20% less? What happens if I, my permeability is higher and I can actually flow the well at 30% more capacity? It's easy to do in a type curve. If I said somebody to, in a, and did perhaps doing an oil field development, they said, oh, well, the big problem is early water breakthrough. I say, well, yeah, yeah that's a real issue because we don't know when to put our water, increase our water handling facilities. If I said to the simulation engineer, okay, water breakthrough is a big problem. Produce me a simulation model where water breaks through 20% early in this part of the field. He says, how do I do that? What does, he, what does he fiddle? What does he change? He probably doesn't know. It's easy to do in a type curve. So type curves, to me, are the bread and butter of planning. But I'll come back to where the, the role they do. Let's just move on. Um, so, well bore modelling. I have sort of three scars I call thermodynamic, where we do a full pressure and temperature profile up the well bore. Um, to me, it's slow. It's actually part of the flow assurance modelling, there's no doubt about that, part of de designing our well bores. But at the end of the day, by and large, in a gas field, we know what our temperature is going to be at the wellhead, maybe 140 degrees, maybe 120, we can get that from our thermodynamic model. 
in an oil field, the temperature profile will probably go up as the water cut increases, but we understand limit. We don't have to integrate that into the model. Uh, Multi-phase flow correlation is fast, requires calibration. They're the, they're the workhorse of, of modeling, world modeling. And I can use type curves very similar to reservoir type curves where I give well deliverability as a function of perhaps wellhead pressure cumulative production. The other line components I put into the model is again facilities modeling, uh, thermodynamic, big process models. I have to say I've never seen a process model, one model which can model a whole gas plant, whether it's an LNG process or whether it's just doing gas for, for LNG. I've never seen a calibrated process thermodynamic model which does the whole thing. They are obviously critical to the design of each component and optimising those components, but I've never seen one that does the whole lot in one hit. And I hate to see how long they take to do that. Uh, linear program. This is a thing you may say, what do, what do I mean by linear program modelling a gas plant? Well, gas plants are interesting. Suppose I'm running an LNG plant and I have uh, LNG specification, I have a DOM gas specification, I have a specification for my ethane, which I'm going to sell us into an ethylene market. I may have propane and LPG markets. I take the view, better or for worse, that people who design gas plants are rational. That the engineers, if you give them the specification and your feed composition is actually uh, appropriate, they will design a gas plant which delivers LNG at the right spec. It will deliver domestic gas at the right spec. It will deliver condensate with the right reed vapour pressure. And, and they will make it work. So the thing is, you don't need to know how they do that. You know that all you need to know is they will do it. So you can actually run a linear program which says, here's my components coming in. What, what goes into each pigeonhole coming out, whether it's LNG, and it will allocate automatically, and that's very quick. And that does your whole gas plant modelling. And they use that consistently modelling refineries. That's how most refinery modelling is done is they put the feedstock in and they say, how much uh, diesel am I going to get? How much gasoline am I going to get? And it does it based on a linear program. They don't worry about the detail because that's up to the process engineers to worry about, not something we need to worry about in a planning program. So, and the other one is yield tables. I often use yield tables where I say, particularly offshore separation, do I need to do a flash? Well, you could do a flash on offshore separation, but it's probably wrong because you don't know liquid carryover, you don't know how it's stabilised, you don't know what, whether it's going to be an oil, water emulsion, emulsion, all those issues you don't know. So you use a simplified model and you say, this is the proximal composition of my liquids, my separated liquids, let's just run that as a yield table. So my facilities modelling can be very simple, but accurate. I mean, working with a a client in the Gippsland Basin, they can actually forecast their ethane out of their gas plant using yield tables and the linear program to within 2% for the short term marketing. And you have to say, what's well, 2%, what does that mean? Well, if they're producing a BCF of gas a day and ethane is something like 6%, 2% of that is something like 0 0.00 whatever percent of the total wall strength. So it's highly accurate. And the other one is compression. Um, we had a discussion before, do I use, how do I model compressors? They can be quite complex beats, beasts. There's a lot of detail goes into them. And we can run numerical modelling. And I'm sure most manufacturers and companies have numerical modelling. I can use, but they're, again, pretty slow. Do they have a role in uh, long-term planning? Not by itself. They may have a role in flow assurance, but they don't, to my mind, have a role in the long-term planning system. Uh, look at compressor curves from the manufacturer, fast and accurate. And you can derive those compressor curves quite simply actually from your numerical model. You can run a very detailed numerical model, give some outlet pressures, put some flow rates in, and it will tell you what the inlet pressure is going to be. And that will be as accurate as running the model itself in the program. Or you can use, if we're doing straightforward planning, we can use a polytropic compressor model uh, as long as we know the efficiency we're going to be operating at. And that, that's for early planning, it's, very, it's quite satisfactory. So what am I going to do now? How am I going to use this? What I'm going to do very quickly, just run through some templates. Yeah, I've started late. Uh, 
just going to run how do I use this component approach. We're going to look at exploration, pre-development planning, sales and markets, flow assurance, LNG portfolio management. And this is my mix and match. This is my assembly line approach. What do I need to go into that? Well, let's look at exploration. You say, well, what's integrated asset um, modelling got to do with exploration? Well, before I go out and drill, I want to know if I find gas, can I sell it? Do I, or do I end up with stranded gas? If I end up with stranded gas, I waste a lot of money in drilling the wells. So before I, when I work with clients, say, do we need a drilling program? I say, let's do a model and see what we could sell if we were successful. So what I do very quickly, I build a model where I've got uh, tank models, because exploration, it's all about how much gas am I going to find or how much oil am I going to find. Uh, simple correlations, simple pressure drops, whatever, simple product yields, and I'm just going to look at my market. Maybe I'm saying I'm going to sell a DOM gas market in Indonesia. What's the average profile? How much can I do? The, and that's a very simple gas planning model. Very quick. I don't need lots of detail. I don't need a simulation model because I've got no reservoirs yet. But I can model that with a tank model and I can go out to average demand. And that's a very simple assembly line approach. Moving forward, if I want to do pre-development planning, what am I going to do? Pre-development planning, we've actually got our reservoirs. We've got a few appraisal wells. We're probably starting to hone down on what the market want. Let's suppose it's gas. So I probably run a simulation model. I've probably got some type curves from simulation model. Uh, from wells, I may have type curves. I'm going to run correlation for my pipelines. Pretty standard correlation, whatever turns you on. Um, you know, there's lots of them out there. Good old bags and brills still used, even though it was only calibrated two inch pipelines. Still used today in big ones. Still works. Uh, compression curves, or I could just put a simple pressure drop for a compressor. I say, at some point, I'm going to have to increase my pressure by 200 psi. Hey. Uh, facilities and going out to market. I've changed the market now. Now I'm going to look at peak demand and average demand. How much do I have to sell? What's my load factor? 100% over average. Can I meet that? This is pretty classic to me pre-development planning model. Later on I might want to do more detail and I can do that by, uh, let's move on. I just come back to this. This again, this is a, a very similar model where I've probably got the whole system running and I do I'm looking at market optimization. Can I sell more gas into the market? And this is frequently the one that we, we tend to run in-house for clients. So I'm running tank models. Uh, correlation for wells, compression curves. A bit more detail perhaps on the products. Contact state spec, I want to get my gas product specs spot on because I want to sell more gas into the market. So I'm starting to, to, to refine my, my solutions. I'm already running. Can I sell extra gas? Can I sell an extra cargo? So I'm putting a lot more detail in here. I might even be going to seasonal demand, perhaps if it's DOM gas in Victoria, for example, or even seasonal demand in the LNG market where we have the, the Northern Hemisphere winter switches on. So I'm starting to refine my model. And the time frame for that project is maybe years, months and days. It depends what aspect I'm looking at. This to me is, is really the bread and butter model that I tend to run most of the time. But there is a role, and I know I've been hard on the simulation and the detailed network people for detailed modelling. I'm going to do fit flow assurance. I need to do that as part of my contractual obligation. I have to be able to show to the client, particularly, that I can deliver the gas. So I'm going to do very detailed th simulation. Maybe I'm going to do full thermodynamic wellbore modelling, because that may be important, particularly, for example, if I have um, uh, uh, sort of, um, asphalt tents, whatever build up in the wells or anything else. I may want to have to look at MEG injection. Uh, I'm going to do full thermodynamics on my well bore, on my pipelines. Compression curves, I, I normally just stick with manufacturers' compression curves, but you can mix and match. If you want to put numerical modelling, you could. Again, for process thermodynamics, I'm probably only going to look at peak demand because peak demand when everything's on. But I may need to look at turndown issues, and particularly with, with meg and hydrates and things like that. And that's where this model comes in. So, but I'm not going to run that at every time point in the model. I'm going to run at key points throughout the process. Maybe I do it once a year. Maybe I'm going to do it um, at, 
a less frequent intervals, but it's, to me it's a snapshot process. And the last one is perhaps LNG portfolio optimization. And here, again, I'm going to use simple reservoir model, simple whirlwind model, simple, maybe simple pressure drop, simple gas plant compression, but I'm putting a hell of a lot of detail into my cargo optimization. And why do I do why, why do I do this detail up to here? It depends what you're running. If I want to know what's the impact of uh, shipping schedules on scheduled maintenance, or what's the ma the other way around, I need to go backwards and forwards. It really depends what your problem is. But I do need a model which integrates cargo scheduling all the way back to at least down to the the, the world and the and the process plant. So. What they've done is that by taking a assembly line approach, and it's modular. Now that VW factory was quite interesting. They assembled top of the range VWs. They also assembled Bentleys on the same process plant. Why do they assemble Bentleys? Because Bentleys had the same chassis, but different body panels. So they could modular approach. And so just moving back, I'm almost done. So. Let's just go back to our assembly line. And the assembly line really here is taking reservoir all the way through to my customer, but doing it in a modular approach. But it's intelligently guided. I'm never advocating automation. I, we need to use our brains. We understand the issues much better than any program I could write. So, what have I learned from Volkswagen? And that's where I started. Well, we should be taking an assembly line approach. We should be doing a modular approach to our asset management. There is no one size fits all. There is no one Volkswagen which suits everybody's needs. They may need a van, they may need a top of the range car, and they may need a, may need a, a second hand Golf. But we need best practice, we need to take a computer assisted approach but it's always hand built. Why? Because we see patterns that computer programs can't. We will know, hang on, we can't put in those, drill those wells at that time because it's in the wrong season, we're in the, in the hurricane season or maybe we need a heavy lift um, barge and it's going to be, be used somewhere else. We, we, we know these things, programs don't. But it has to be fit for purpose. We have to understand model accuracy. Just because it's a full 3D numerical simulation model does not mean it is more accurate. And people say, what do you mean by that? And I said, well, something is only accurate if we can measure the difference between our model and the real world. How do we measure the difference between a simulation model and what's going to happen 30 years in the future? We can't. And if you look at the history of pre-development reserves versus post-development reserves, they go all over the place. So simulation is good for making sure that we have captured the dynamics in our reservoir model as it flows through the system, but they're not particularly useful for long-term planning. We're much better off with a tight curve approach which we can flex to actually match the real uncertainties. I say they have to be modular, at some point we may want to run a detailed thermodynamic whirlpool model, at some point we may want to run a simple correlation. And they have to be fast enough. I do emphasise speed. Um, we've been talking to a client recently whose simulation model takes 36 hours to run. It's just the simulation model. If we then added a detailed network model and a, a process thermodynamic model, we're probably talking about um, three days to get a result. How can you do optimization of development if it takes you three days to do one run? And that's excluding the acknowledged problems of data errors and getting integration and how do we pass data between each point. So we do need a fast, timely approach. So that's really the, the takeaway message of the integrated asset modeling bit. What's th what are the conclusions that I come from? Well. I'm going to quote from Deloitte again. Australia should innovate its oil and gas business along the lines of a factory. Not just any factory, intelligent factory. Top of the range, VW transparent factory. And the investment in best technology and best practice is not a luxury. 
We've seen in the Australian motor vehicle industry, because that investment wasn't made, it has disappeared. We, as a group of people, are not immune to these issues. Just take that on board. We are not immune to the Australian oil and gas industry disappearing as we know it today. And, but if we do not make that investment, investment in a modern integrated asset modelling along the lines that suit your corporate objectives will ensure we do have a sustainable future. And that, that's the end of the presentation. And I want to say thank you very much for inviting me here to talk about this. And uh, there's my little integrated <laughs> digital oil and gas factory. Thank you very much. How do we actually implement this modular kind of yeah. approach without the use of spreadsheets? How do we actually implement it? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I, I've, over the years I've developed software to do that, but um, and it, 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 there is integration along the lines, but I think what it is is that uh, any, any company can do that, um, that you could actually generate your own software to do it but uh, there are software vendors out there who do supply an integrated modelling approach. The thing that I find interesting about the VW factory is that it was started in, online in 2002. They started building it in 1999, which took three years to build, which is not particularly long, I think, compared to some of our developments, and it only cost them 136 million euro, about $300 million, which I find incredibly cheap. So I think, you know, in, in all of our stuff, you, you can make a decision as a corporate to build a system which will suit your operation, or you can look at the, the software vendors and work with them to put something together which is, is modular and does fit your process. But um, over the years, you know, I've implemented systems which capture a lot of that, but not, 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 all, not everything in that. I have about 5,000 things going through my mind here on what to address. And, uh, um, this reliability factor and the human, the human involvement, and when we have things like climate change that can impact us. Um, Australia may be lucky to get rid of the oil industry in the sense that they've got a lot of electrical power. but. Um, how do you, there is a, I'm actually involved with the SPE group at the moment that wants to assist them to collaborate with the different investors and different people from the beginning to the end and that kind of thing. But I was wondering about the aspect of condition monitoring. So you have that whole system and you learn and respond to condition changes. Now it could be it could be market changes, it can be climate change and that sort of issues. Do you see being able to bring in something like condition monitoring? Are, are you familiar with that term? Not a hundred percent, I have to say. Uh, we have implemented, um, maybe not quite what you're talking about, and I apologise, is that um, uh, actually Quite a long time ago when the Insala gas field in Algeria was, was put on production and they do CAT sequestration, we actually implemented an integrated model there and looking at the, the order in which fields do and one of the parts of that was actually learning with, with a learning approach that as you drilled wells and, and you learnt, you got yeah. more, you, 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 you learnt, got feedback from and that feedback, that learning experience actually changed how you did your development. So, but it, it does involve, you know, that, that's sort of getting a little almost wider than, than perhaps I was intending to speak here, but, but once you've got a modular system, you can actually impose on top of that a, a feedback loop to, to, do, to do learning. Yeah. So. And we have the Moconda blowout, the Lucy Mud Volcano, the Montero blowout. Yeah. All these things cost millions, which went to legal. <laughs> we haven't learned anything. All right, just one last question from Stephen. Yeah. Um, just, just wait. I really hear what you say about um, you know, simplifying your analyses to make it fit for purpose, both in terms of the, 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 the uh, components in the, in the uh, production line that you identified that are maybe faster, uh, and also by maybe, maybe uh, looking at the different time periods, making it more core-strained on, on certain analyses. Um, 
My question was, is in terms of most detailed ones, the ones that are most computationally intensive, is it just a resource constraint, a, a processing constraint? You know, if you could throw you know, the Google cluster at it and you could get the, th the, the 36 hour simulation in a minute, is that actually technically a superior modeling solution? to the, these fast ones, or uh, I'd just like to hear what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, um, if I get what you're saying, if I could run my simulation models very quickly with my detailed pipeline model, am I going to get a better solution? And I'm going to say, no. The, the problem is, is that, again, I go back to what I say about simulation. Simulation can be very precise, but precisely wrong because we can't calibrate it to future production. And when we're doing long-term planning, I'm planning 40 years into the future, does that early best simulation model actually have any relevance 40 years down the future? Our job is to say, look, this is the best model we get. I I'm not going to dispute that, it's the best case. But how can it be different? What, what would it, how different could it be before our development plan is wrong? Now, take a, a, a good oil field development in Western Australia, which is now shut in and abandoned, and I hope I'm not offending anybody here, but take the, the Griffin field, right? Griffin finally produced at shut in in 2009 168 million barrels of oil, which is a pretty impressive production history. When they, the facilities they put in, when they first built it, it's all subsea. Uh, tied back to a platform, they were planning on 30 million barrels. With their development approach, it was incredibly difficult to go away and do extra appraisal drilling. Perhaps, you know, they did horizontal wells, but the number of slots, the number of tiebacks, how you did it was extremely limited. And my view is that, that you know, I'm not going to say they got it completely wrong, which they did, well, they, they got it completely <laughs> wrong. <laughs> But, you know, 30 million barrels to 168 million barrels and your whole development scheme turns out to be actually inappropriate for 168. To me, in hindsight, now hindsight's great, you know, I wish you can go and buy it in the shop, but, you know, it, it, it's, uh, in hindsight you're saying, this wasn't a good development. How much oil would have we got if you'd, someone said, well, hang on, what happens if we got oil in the Zaypart and the Birdrong and Chinook and whatever, and what happens if our, our upside map turns out to be right? How, how would we cope with that in our development? And frequently, I'm called upon to do reserves analysis, right? And you've got your, your P90 locus, your P50 and your P10. And, they, and people say, isn't this great? This is our P10, got the upside. And you say, but your development plan, you won't be able to produce it because you constrain the number of slots on your platform. How am I going to get that P10? So I'm going to wipe that P10 off your economics. And they go, oh, you can't do that. And you say, no, you're not going to get it because you have a failure of imagination. Now, I'm not saying we go and rush out. I mean, I'm a shell man. Shell gold plate, used to, anyway, when I was there. Gold plate everything. They always oversized everything. Working for Exxon, Exxon always exactly sized everything. But at the time, unto Exxon and Shell were the largest oil companies, both were pretty profitable, so both strategies worked. One could get the upside easily, the other could just extend field life. But the whole point is, is that it becomes a failure of imagination if you don't look at the, at the issues. You don't look at what happens if we get unexpected compartmentalisation. What happens if we got our stress distribution wrong, so these, all these faults which we thought were open turn out to be ceiling. How is that going to impact the number of wells we need to drill? And how do we do that in a simulation model which is biased and constrained from day one? And it's that bias which I'm, I'm concerned about. Not that the simulation model is wrong, not that we should be run them. I, I run them all the time. But it's how wrong is it going to be and is that going to impact us down the line? And how do I cope with it? Maybe you come to the conclusion and say, I can't cope with it. Our base, base development plan is the right one. But at the end of the day, we need to have done that exercise. You know, you, other people call it scenario analysis or whatever you want to call it. But if I'm doing scenario analysis, how do I go away and build a simulation model and say, hey, let's assume we've got twice the gas. Come on, Geos, build me a, give me some maps which has got twice the gas. Ah, come on. But I can do it very quickly with a, a type curve.
and, and that's the, the takeaway message. All right. Thanks, Sorry. Andrew. And thanks, thanks for the presentation man. today. It's a taking appreciation. Thank you. Thank you very much.